The budget speech is proudly brought to you by Chartered Accountants South Africa. A CASA can help your business take off and rise above your tax headache. Find a CASA tax advisor in your area. Go to findacasa.co.za. Welcome to the CNBC Africa South Africa budget special. I'm Nozi Pombandra here in Johannesburg, but as always, not alone, Lindsay Williams in Cape Town. Yes, of course, Cape Town is the seat of democracy in South Africa. You've got potholes in Johannesburg. We've got democracy and parliament in Cape Town. Minister Nene stood up at the podium for his uh, debut speech. I thought he did quite well, but it was, it wasn't, there were no surprises. There were no ups, there were no downs, and I quite like that. Uh, I think boring is the new bling. What do you think? I don't know. Firstly, I want to go back to your first point where you took a jab at us about our potholes. Um, I don't know if uh, democracy lived up to uh, its promise. What was it about a week and a half ago when you had all that drama and fist fighting? Watch yourself, Williams. But uh, here in Johannesburg, we're going to be uh, unpacking uh, the market reaction really to, uh, to the speech. And what, from what it seems from face value, not much reaction. And maybe that's a very, very good thing. Uh, but no doubt we're going to be doing that. We've got joined here in Johannesburg by Adrian Seville, he's the CIO at uh, Canon Asset Management. Joseph Boucher, he's the CEO of JM Boucher Investment Group and Lesiba Mutata, economist at Investment Solutions. And of course, uh, sitting with Lindsay in Cape Town is Adam Ibrahim, is the CEO of Oasis Asset Management and Arno Lawrence, he is the CIO of Atlantic Asset Management. Um, and they're all going to be joining us for some analysis. Let's start off in Joburg. Uh, Adrian, Give a sense of uh, your overall takeaway, but most importantly, uh, how the lack of market reaction, uh, me what it means rather for, for South Africa. Yeah, thanks, Nzipa. Um, <coughs> South Africa has some world-class institutions, and tr National Treasury is one of them. Um, and I think they delivered on promise today uh, an absolutely superb job of putting together a very carefully and wisely crafted uh, national budget mm. that um, uh, does exactly what uh, both you and Lindsay alluded to. No surprises. Uh, and we are very often caught up in hand-wringing ahead of the budget that there's going to be some drama, super VAT, uh, super tax, um, uh, something that upsets the apple cart, and there was nothing. And I think that that is absolutely wonderful. You want national budgets to be just like central bankers, dull and mm. boring. Just before we went on air, you made mention of the fact that uh, preference shares, though, did uh, show some movement in anticipation of some tax changes, no doubt. Yeah, I think that there was a little bit of anxiety uh, ahead of the reading of the budget that because of the shortfall in taxes that the minister would be looking in unusual places. And there was a pricing in the uh, preference share market that... Uh, put some discount mm. in, uh, into that. And that didn't uh, transpire, but the bond market didn't react, the currency market hardly reacted, stock market hasn't responded, it's fantastic. Lesiba, Lindsay in Cape Town, I mean, the, the fact that there was no reaction, the fact that there was no big moves to the upside or the downside is testimony to the fact that so maybe the overseas markets don't really look at this budget. They will do over the uh, medium and long term, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't look at it. They look at the company results that come out of our uh, JSC Securities Exchange. But it is very gratifying to see one government department doing things that don't disturb us. And uh, I, I don't know, it makes me sleep well at night, I think. It's comforting. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure it's all that well as explained here. <laughs> My take is slightly different in that uh, the minister said something important. He said there's this structural gap between revenue and needs. Mm. But what came out is a commitment to increasing more needs, um, expenditure, um, and, 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 and revenue has been increased by eating potential fruit in the future. So I think, I think, I think I'm very disappointed in the budget. Mm. I don't think it is a growth budget. I think um, we're growing at 1.5% we've seen in, in the numbers of GDP. We have structurally been stuck in this situation and will be so in the next two, three, five years. Mm -hmm. There is no impetus that's been put down from the fiscal basis to lift us out of this rut. Mm -hmm. And I'm dismayed. Higher taxes, we have resigned ourselves to that they need to be higher. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. There's no way that they contribute to higher growth. And we need growth in this country. Uh, so I'm dismayed. I'm not, I'm not all that enthused. Joseph, dismayed, disappointed. He's in the doldrums. He's not liking anything that's come out of Tlantlanene. And Lisiva actually had an article in one of the leading papers talking about his expectations leading up to this budget. What were your expectations? And didn't Tlantlanene meet them? I, I think it has to be very cautious. It was a balancing act. Remember, uh, before this, our GDP numbers were not looking very good, apart from the surprise that came for the last three months of last year, which was above 4%. So the entire market was expecting really a wider uh, deficit and obviously negativity looking um, into, into 2015, 2016. And the downgrading that could have happened uh, should things obviously have come uh, different uh, for, from that. So he had to do a balancing act so that at least from, uh, from, from a fiscal point of view, you kind of say, you know, there is discipline that is coming through. We're going to control expenditure. But how is going to move it from 36% in terms of mm. uh, wage bill of the GDP to something lower, we, we don't know. The debt levels obviously remain a little bit higher. But for me, possibly what was quite interesting is that he wants to encourage the Africans to save money. Okay, so the middle income guys, transfer duties, you're not going to pay anything there. So he's trying to say, let's move into, into the homes, let's move into, into savings, uh, mm -hmm. because you, you, you basically don't know. So there wasn't anything exciting in his maiden speech. I mean, remember uh, Mr. Trevor Manuel, when he came through, he said he supported uh, all blacks in the market or the ranch took a, a knock. So yeah. it was a nanny market moving <laughs> event because he decided to be very conservative uh, in there. But for me, what I wanted to have seen was more clarity in terms of uh, education and training. I know mm. it's about 800 billion that has been allocated there. But I wanted to see which sectors, in particular uh, vocational training and artisans, South Africa would say, we've got a skills uh, gap here, let's put money mm. into this sector. Let's bring this back to Cape Town. Uh, in the studio with me is uh, Adam Ibrahim from Oasis Asset Management. Uh, Adam, these are the three words that just came out from Lesiba from Investment Solutions. Not enthused, that's not a, a word, that's a, a phrase. Not enthused, disappointed, dismayed, but you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. I mean, he's had very little to work with. I mean, generally, what was your impression? I think government over the long term, since 2010, has been crowding out the private sector since 2010 and including this budget we've actually had a tax and spend environment and it's really and then very little value for money from the expenditure that we have so today our companies are short of electricity at high prices we have service delivery issues and importantly the consumer today also has a lot of issues that they face with and the consumer is actually bearing most of the tax burden so personal taxes, VAT, and then massive rises in fuel levies. Fuel levies today make up 41% as of today of the petrol price compared to 28% yesterday. And so we actually need to stand back and say, yes, we need austerity, but this is not austerity because you've got very high real government revenue growth, so taxes, very high government expenditure, and very little value for money to the consumer. And so we have to stand back and say, you get to spend, spend wisely, spend on infrastructure, get us electricity, get us, infra uh, get us schools, get us uh, education. And so I actually don't think it's disappointing. It's been more of the same. And um, we actually ne need to stand back as a society because the government is a reflection of what government wants and um, government needs to prioritize and make sure we have an economy that looks after the poor, the middle class, and the rich. And I think at the moment, the, uh, the middle class has been squeezed very, very dramatically well, in this we budget. Have to be. We, we, uh, when I say we, I mean I consider myself uh, in the middle class because I've got a job and I earn money and I pay taxes. 28% to 41%. Uh, Arno Lawrence, welcome to uh, the show from uh, Atlantic. I mean, that's a, that's a staggering increase. What would have happened if there hadn't been a fall of 115 to 45 in the oil price, back up to 60 at the moment? What would the minister have done? It boggles the mind. Well, I think this is where all the speculation was prior to the budget in the sense of which rabbit is he going to pull out of the hat? Is it going to be corporate taxes? Is it personal taxes? Is it capital gains taxes? Is it taxes, further taxes on dividends? He had a lot of options in a sense and he chose to go 
a very simplistic route with you know a one percent sort of bland increase I suppose in a sense with a few sort of um, how I could put almost it almost uh, unnoticeable one yes. percent you think one percent yeah, that's nothing that's right yeah so yeah. I think definitely the oil price story um, has helped but I think what we need to interrogate perhaps a little bit further here is that you know now that they've taken away the the drop in the oil price in terms of uh, you know feeling it in your pockets uh, we need to look at it in the sense of, well, what does it do to the man in the street? How do they feel? What about uh, our inflation prospects? Because now everybody was banking on a really good inflation outlook, but I think you know by tomorrow morning uh, our economists are going to be uh, ratcheting the inflation forecasts up again. Well, let's have a look at this now. I mean, the, what I've got here is a flash um, a, a figure here, and um, the inflation is supposed to be 4.3% in 2015, 5.9% 2016, 17. 2017, 18. I don't know how they can project that 5.7 percent. Nazipo, you've got a huge car in Johannesburg. You must be gutted. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the size of my car, what that car is. But let's talk about other modes of transport. Uh, Adrian, uh, no doubt I want, I'm sure you want to have a bash at some of the comments that I've made, but also maybe comment on uh, the Paris data, the SAA, uh, back in focus. Not much detail. We know we're in the ninth turnaround strategy. All you're saying is we're still working on it. Uh, ESCOM, nothing new surprising there other than to say, you know, what we had pledged last year, we're going to continue with that. Not much mention of the post office, which I guess is also maybe one of the, those uh, parastatals that should come into really, really sharp focus. Do you think that uh, SOEs uh, got the attention uh, that they need? I was very disappointed with the uh, uh, detail on, on the SOEs. There was an anticipation in the market that we would get the necessary information on how Eskim, for instance, would be, would be funded, and all we got was a reiteration of uh, three installments over the next 18 months. Mm. Um, absolutely no reference to more efficient or intelligent, wise use of uh, the state uh, balance sheet, which is one, one of the biggest balance sheets in the country. Um, and uh, there is this glaring deficit between uh, service requirement and service delivery, uh, well beyond municipalities and deep into the SOEs. And I think, um, you know, to go back to the point that I was making about Treasury being world class, uh, I don't want to, I, I don't want this to be misinterpreted, that I think this r results in world class consequences, which I think, um, you know, is uh, Lesiba's dismay. And Adam really captured uh, what I think is the, uh, wh where we should be putting our attention is the numbers are brilliant. The numbers are absolutely superb and this was a very tricky balancing act and he's balanced superbly. Uh, but we happen to have given 8% more of uh, national spending to education mm. and our education system ranks as the worst in the world. Uh, this is not about where the money's going. This right. is about how the money is being managed once it has arrived in the delivery pot. I know that Joseph will have uh, a comment on that because he had raised education initially. But before we do that, let's go back to Cape Town. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting point you made there, Adrian. Not about where the money is going, but how it's being managed. Uh, Adam, that's a fair point, isn't it? I mean, this is a, an age-old problem. We've, we've, we've come so far since 1994, but maybe we're uh, falling, uh, falling by the wayside a little bit when it comes to that money management. I think money is available. I think money is never been an issue in South Africa, surprisingly. Um, we've got great institutions. We've got a functioning tax system. SARS is one of the best institutions in South Africa mm. and globally on collecting efficiently. Um, our pension funds, our so, you know, government pension funds, our private pension funds, so we've got a great functioning um, funding mechanism. What the problem is, is the delivery mechanism and the standards. And I think the issue really is that we are not tough enough on getting high standards through education. We're talking about numbers rather than high quality numbers, you know, so high grades and raising the standards continuously. If we do that in our organizations and in our education and in our homes, we will actually raise the bar and actually start producing the people that we need because we've got a mismatch in South Africa of lots of jobs needed and lots of people looking for work but different skills. Mm. Yeah. So we, but that's know. going to take two or three generations. I mean, Zippo, we, we mustn't be too hard on ourselves here. We're not Russia, we're not Greece. 
uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, we, we have to do a little bit better. All this money is coming in, but uh, there's a bottleneck and it's not getting distributed uh, properly. Delivery is the key here. That's what I'm getting from Adam. Delivery is certainly the key, and I want to bring that very point back to you, Joseph. Maybe I'm being pedantic here. I've got two major uh, concerns around the education statements made today. The first is that the minister, tr minister tries to give us details. He tells us we're going to be seeing two textbooks per learner. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about paperless classrooms and e-learning and, e and moving onto an online platform. Why are we priding ourselves on uh, giving students more textbooks? The other part element of it is that again he reinforces uh, the commitment to the to the national student financial aid scheme for tertiary education the issue here isn't about the money the issue is that they aren't able to get the loans that they make they can't get the payments back they can't track the students but most importantly the students aren't passing because they're not getting out of those universities so there's no money to pay back i just feel lost when it comes to this education conversation. You're absolutely correct, Shinozi. I, I think let's look at it in terms of where is the education. So, so last week, as you mentioned, talking about paperless uh, education system, uh, but some few years ago, we had a problem with the distribution of textbooks. Now, if you're going to say you want to distribute two textbooks per student, the operations management of it, I think the key issue here, which is Adam mentioned as well, and you mentioning, is how do we manage it? Possibly for me, is to zoom in in terms of skills we require as a country to take the country forward. And then how do we capacitate them and make sure that they deliver? So I think for me, it's operations management. We need to make sure that it's done and management uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, state-owned entities. Now, if you look at Land Bank, ESCOM, SAA, on average, no CEO has been there for more than two years. Land Bank has had more than 10 CEOs since to uh, 1994, okay? SABC, these are state organs that really deliver to the people. So, so ESCOM, uh, SABC, um, even Deno itself, SAA, Transnet, at least there's stability there since Brian Mollifi came through. But I think what we need to do is to say, how do we train the right managers that will be able to motivate and deliver and keep the strategy uh, moving forward? So it's really not just putting the money, as we all agree there's enough money in South Africa. Uh, the students were not even getting the money. This they've just raised, the SRC raised mm -hmm. money, about one million uh, water to still also decide to say, please, individuals and other students come and donate money for those students that are being excluded. So it's really in the management of those funds, as Adrian said, and basically the implementation of uh, what's required. Adrian Saville, just before the break, um, if you were an overseas investor and you were watching uh, this programme and you'd heard the budget speech from Minister Nene uh, this afternoon, would you be saying, actually, uh, maybe pencil in South Africa for foreign direct investment in the future or even uh, some short-term investment in the JC Securities Exchange? What was your sense over the last few hours? Uh, lukewarm. Um, Lesipa made the point, there's, th there's nothing exciting in this. There, this is not a pro-growth or anything that uh, points to obvious immediate catalysts. Uh, back to the delivery issue, um, infrastructure, for instance, is the, that's the burning question, is where is this infrastructure that we've been talking about for uh, the best part of half a decade? Um, and if, I think if we saw that, you, you would get immediate uh, international interest. It's just dull. Dull, that seems to be uh, the letter of the day. Dull, disappointing, uh, and dismayed. I think those were the three words uh, that made the highlight of this particular show. A very big thank you to Adrian Saville, CIO, uh, Canon Asset Management, and Joseph Boucher, who's the CEO of JM Boucher Investment Group. Lesiva stays with us uh, for the next segment. We'll see you straight after the break. Welcome back to CNBC Africa's coverage of Budget 2015. Still with us, uh, Adam Ibrahim, CEO of Oasis Asset Management, and Arno Lawrence, CIO of Atlantic Asset Management, both in Cape Town with Lindsay Williams, and here in Johannesburg, still with me, Lesiva Motata, economist at Investment Solutions. Arno, let's come to you and just get a sense of uh, what do you think the rating agencies walked away with uh, from this particular delivery? Yeah, I think uh, we bought ourselves time, uh, in a sense. Uh, I think there was very much a grave concern that uh, what they were going to do was going to be inherently um, 
growth robbing in a sense, uh, taking away money by raising taxes. And yes, they've even dropped the, the growth forecasts going forward. We think they might even still be optimistic from, from, from our perspective. So I, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. We sort of edged a little bit closer to the, uh, the edge of the woods. But I think, um, you know, definitely from that perspective, we've bought ourselves time. Delivery is the key. It's very good to have a plan, as the minister himself says, but it's not enough. Let's stay with you there. When you say um, over-optimistic, uh, GDP growth uh, was ratified, uh, I think just yesterday, 1.5% year on year. We had a nice bounce back after a low base in the third quarter to the fourth quarter. What, is your, what are your expectations for 2015, 16 and beyond? Because you are a, a, a curmudgeon like a lot of other people I've spoken to you are, and 2 2.5% is simply not going to be attained. That's right. I, I think uh, um, in the analysis that we've uh, done and looked at, we've even said you know 2% might even still be stretching things. Given the constraints on the energy side, how do you grow without increasing your energy consumption? I think that's the key thing. Yeah. The minister spoke about trying to focus on less energy intensive sectors, uh, but when it comes to delivery on the ground in terms of supporting those sectors, use tourism as an example. Last year with the visa announcements, they've said they're going to review them now because I think they've realized they've shot themselves in the foot of a sector where, yes, you don't need necessarily a lot of energy, but uh, you know, it's, this is the thing, is that the, the internal consistencies in the budget itself of policies that are put out there mm. and then the actual uh, delivery on the ground is not always the same. Adams, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Nazipo, Adams is nodding away here at some of the sense that has been uh, spoken by Arno. Uh, embellish what he's just said. I think you've got massive constraints, electricity, you've got labor issues, and you've got service delivery issues. That together with um, a, um, a demand for beneficiation, adding value to our minerals. And when you're adding ma uh, a value to your minerals beneficiation, you're actually taking electricity, which we don't have, and adding it to the minerals, and then d d um, uh, creating value add. And we're encouraging that, yet we don't have electricity. And we're penalizing companies for not doing beneficiation and so a lot of the policies are actually not pro-growth. And if you look at electricity, what we should be doing, and through all the um, state-owned enterprises, they are quasi-monopolies, -mono if not monopolies. And if you actually encourage reform and privatization, and, and also competition, so you don't actually have to privatize some of the SOEs, you can just create competition. And the companies like Sassel, who could produce electricity very cheaply. Um, there are many, many companies who are actually producing electricity, like the sugar producers. They could add a huge amount of electricity into the grid, but they're not able to do that because the regulation's not in place, mm. the, um, the pricing policies are not in place. So we, we, there are solutions, and there are actually quick solutions and low-hanging solutions that could solve many of the problems. Was this tackled in the budget speech today? Probably not part of the budget speech, Nazipa. Lisiba, I, I think I want to pick up on that point and that conversation down in Cape Town around the inconsistencies around policy and mm. maybe be a bit controversial and say maybe where there was uh, harmonization, where there was consistency, was around small business. Here we're hearing mm. of uh, a tax relief uh, for small business and small business desks mm. so that small businesses can uh, conduct their business a little bit further. Do you get a sense that, you know, do you share the optimism that I see uh, on the small business front in that regard? Yeah, no, I think I think they've they've announced some measures uh, around small businesses, but not not enough, right? The 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 situation that we find ourselves, and we talk about SMMEs as that will be, which can drive growth, can take us out of unemployment situation. The talk and there's some money that's been put behind it all, but it's not sufficient enough to make a dent to the to the big big the deep macro hole that we find ourselves mm. in. So I, I am quite enthused that there was that outcome, but it's not, it's not sufficient. Let's enough. connect it back to the conversation that was also brewing in Cape Town around uh, economic growth. Right. And I mean, we've clearly pegged from uh, previous speeches that if we're going to see job creation, it's going to come mm. from the small business sector. Mm -hmm. Are you getting a, a, a sense of confidence, though, that enough is being done to support uh, this uh, particular uh, you know, fraternity so that they can deliver on the targets that we've set for them in the NDP, which, by the way, only got a half a mention? Yeah, which is worrying because we've aimed to grow at 5%, right? Mm -hmm. 
and we are supporting small and medium enterprises, but th the hole that we're in is bigger and it requires much more robust macro approach. That is not status quo. Where we're going, we've, we've entrenched our economy to growth that cannot exceed 2.5%. That is below potential, and this is now for the next five, 10 years. So, in fact, I'm very concerned about that situation because growth, GDP growth, is the only way out of our social ills. If you're not going to be growing sufficient enough to deal with youth unemployment, even bo boosting the, the, the small and medium enterprise situations, we are, we're going nowhere quickly as an economy. We've got needs that are, uh, they are lofty. Mm. Our, our expenditure uh, demands are very lofty. And there isn't the savings, there isn't the resource to fund it. And I'm very concerned from that perspective. Back to um, Lesiba says the following, Arno, he says um, uh, the only way out of our social ills is to grow the economy, GDP growth at 1.5%, maybe we get 2% um, uh, uh, next year. Um, let's look at, look at the markets though, you're in the fixed income uh, sphere. When you sit down tomorrow morning or Monday morning when you've had a chance to have a look at the whole uh, budget and analyse it in the minutiae, um, what will you say? Will you say, I'm going to buy bonds, I'm going to put my money in cash, I'm going to have a, continue with equities because of the international markets? Uh, what will you do? Probably not much, <laughs> but let me sort of explain. Look, the, right now, the global environment is bond-friendly in the sense of a lower growth, especially in amongst our trading partners or major trading partners. Hmm. Um, the oil price should have been a catalyst for lower inflation numbers. Um, so. Some of those positives have been taken it away. It has been. 4.4% was the last print. Yeah, but it's all in the price already. Mm. So now we've been t now some of that good has been taken away, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the other positive, though, has been the fact that we've bought a little bit of time. Mm. I just don't think that what we... There are some positives, in a sense, here. And again, I'll refer back to the inconsistencies in policy that an investor, a longer-term investor... Because, look, what we're not trying to do is attract portfolio flows. That's there, yes. For this country really to move forward as we should be, um, we should be looking at you know, foreign direct investment into infrastructure projects and so forth. That we Asia should be mentioned. going on a roadshow. We should say this is the budget, but on the other hand, this is our long-term vision. N mm. Nazipa, I want to expand upon this later. Yeah. You come in here. I want to go back uh, to Adam and to maybe keep it in Cape Town and uh, stick with the infrastructure theme that seems to be developing there. The minister reinforcing uh, and uh, re uh, recommitting really to the tolling system in South Africa. No doubt uh, consumers who, like myself, were really, really hoping that we're going to get away with no, not paying e-tolls are quite disappointed. But surely investors look at this and say, well, this is a government to make sure that if we're going to be investing uh, in infrastructure, there is a means and a mechanism of ensuring that uh, consumers who use uh, that infrastructure are going to be able to allow us to realize uh, a return on that investment. Receiver, I really think that the real issue is the difference between direct taxes and indirect taxes. You've just had a massive incre increase in an indirect tax like fuel levies, um, which happens and we don't moan about it. And you know, the, the road accident fund is a massive, massive, massive issue. A 50 uh, cents a litre increase in the road accident fund, we should be addressing that. And I think by having a direct tax like uh, toll roads, um, gets us the service delivery directly because you can see the pr end product. It matches revenue and service delivery. And it actually doesn't, we are spending so much money on fuel levies but the roads are not being delivered on the national, whereas the toll roads are being delivered. So I'm actually a supporter of toll roads. I'm actually a supporter of user pay, but I'm also a supporter of better capitalized SOEs so that you're not using user pay um, funding capital and revenue through a user pay system and um, in the short term. You actually have to do it over the long term and so maybe the question is the toll charges may be too high, um, but we should have them because in Gauteng, you actually have very, very, very good roads. 
we in Cape Town, the major roads, um, you're looking at me, Lindsay, the <laughs> highways are You've fantastic. You've been to recently. R21 is fantastic. Have you driven around the northern suburbs of Johannesburg R21 recently? R21 has been fantastic. Um, N1 is fantastic. Adam, N3 Adam, is fantastic. Um, I have to cut in. The Gauw train is fantastic. Adam, won't you Lizzie please, please just repeat that? Because she fell down a pothole no. earlier on, and now she's <laughs> trying to d d make me look silly. I have to have Adam repeat uh, that line. I think Adam said, uh, Nozipo, you have really, really good roads in Gauteng. I think Lindsay didn't hear you quite well, so if you just repeat that point and then continue with uh, that analysis. <laughs> Away you go, Adam. I think if you take, let's take the Gauteng train. Uh, uh, the Gauteng train is a massive investment in commuter um, supply. Um, it's a great asset. You don't actually have to sit on the roads. Um, we don't have that in Cape Town. We have a bridge that's incomplete. You want to move in the city, there's gridlock. And so I would actually pay to have, one, the bridge completed so we can actually move um, through the city. Secondly, if you go down, one of the biggest tourist um, sites in South Africa is the drive up to the whale village, Hermanus, and uh, the, the, the shark village, uh, Hansberg. If you have to go through um, Somerset West, there should be a national road through there. I'm happy to pay that. Um, you know, we actually need greater investment in our infrastructure. Some of it needs to be delivered by government as a core service, and then some, uh, some of it must be delivered by the users who have to pay. So that's why. Well, well that's a very big thank you to our uh, guests. A uh, very no. big thank you to Adam Ibrahim. Uh, he is the CEO of Oasis Asset Management and Arno Lawrence. He's the CIO of Atlantic Asset Management. And of course, uh, Lucibo Motata, who had uh, joined me here from Johannesburg. Lindsay, uh, before we go, I, I must say that um, uh, you got a beating today. Yes. Uh, I think you got a thorough beating today. And uh, if there's one thing I can say to you is... Move to Joburg. This is where it's at. I can tell you one thing about the road system in South Africa in general. If you have a look at the road system and if you gave it to somebody today who's a road builder or a, 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 a logistics engineer, you would say that previous governments, not this government, previous governments, the road system is absolutely extraordinarily badly designed. That's all, all I will say. But what I will say as well is if you're in a, a traffic jam in Cape Town, the view is fantastic and you don't worry about it. In Johannesburg, <laughs> you get all angry. Nazupa, back to you. No, I'll let you uh, take that one, Lindsay. I'll concede on that one. Uh, we're going to go into a short break, but when we come back, we continue this conversation. And of course, Johannesburg com continues uh, to give Cape Town a smackdown. Mm -hmm.